Today we're in chapter 23. Let's begin reading at verse 44. I'll read verses 44 through 49, and we'll get into our study. Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 44. Luke writes, Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that sight, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. So as we, as we begin, Jesus has been crucified, as we saw last time, and now he's been on the cross for some time. As a matter of fact, in verse 44, we see that it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. So Jesus has been on the cross for about three hours at this time, because when you cross-reference this with Mark's gospel, chapter 15, verse 25, Mark tells us that Jesus was crucified at nine in the morning. And so now it's noon, the sixth hour. So from noon until three, there's darkness over the whole land. And it's interesting how he says this. Notice with me, verse 44, there was darkness over all the earth. And then verse 45, the sun was darkened. It's interesting when you think about that for a moment, because on the night that Jesus was born, the sky was filled with supernatural light. And that was because Jesus is the light of the world. So it would be fitting that his birth would be accompanied by light. Luke tells us in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were greatly afraid. And so on the night he was born, there was a, a, a sky that's filled with supernatural, supernatural light. But on the, on the day that he dies, at noon, when the sun is at its brightest, the sky now begins to be darkened. And Luke tells us in verse 45 that from noon until three, in, there, was, there was darkness that filled the land. Now, somebody would ask the question, why was it dark? What is the significance of this? Why is there darkness? Well, when you read your Bible, you discover that oftentimes darkness symbolizes judgment. You'll see darkness as a symbol of judgment. You see that in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. In Exodus, in chapter 10, verses 21 and 22, it says, the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky so that darkness will spread over Egypt, darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. Amos tells us in chapter 5, verse 18, Woe unto you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. And so you see that in the Bible, in the Old Testament, darkness is a symbol of judgment. In Matthew chapter 25, in the New Testament, verse 30, Jesus says, throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So in the Old Testament, as well as the New, you see that darkness can be used as a symbol of judgment. And so we know that when there's darkness on the earth, there's a symbol of judgment that's taking place. And so the cross is a place of divine judgment. The sins of the world are poured out vicariously on the Son of God. And supernatural darkness expresses God's response to sin. There's an Old Testament book, Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 13, and there it says to the Lord, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. This is a symbol of God's rejection of the sinfulness of man and the necessity for judgment as it relates to that. And so darkness fills the land, and the land was dark for three hours. One ancient writer believed that that was a picture of spiritual darkness enshrouding those who crucified Jesus Christ. When Paul was writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, he said, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is also the image of God. I have people ask me quite often, uh, concerning friends or family members, why is it that they don't see? And the biblical answer is, is because they walk in spiritual darkness. 
because they don't have the light of life, because they haven't opened their hearts to Christ, because they haven't been illuminated to see things that are spiritual. We have the responsibility as ministers of the gospel, and all of us who are believers have been called by God to be witnesses of Jesus, witnesses to what he's done, and witnesses to what he can do, and living testimonies of what he does in a human life. I mean, that's what we're called to do. That's what we are. When Jesus said, you shall receive the Holy Spirit, and you'll be witnesses to me, he wasn't saying that we're simply going to go out and do the act of witnessing, meaning take tracts and hand them out. That's something we do, and I think it's a good thing to do. But he was also pointing out that your life is a living testimony of the work of God, that people see the way that you live and the things that you believe, the things that you do, and, and, and they, they are actually either attracted or they are repelled. But, but that's what it's all about, you see. And so what happens is, is we take this light of the gospel out, we share it with people, we open our hearts when God gives us the opportunity, and we share, we tell people, well, this is what God can do, this is what God has done. And and we used to call it just witnessing. That's what we do. We, we share our faith. We live our faith, and, and we share our faith. But what happens when you live and share your faith and people don't want to hear? Why don't they hear? Well, the biblical answer is it's because they're enshrouded in darkness. It's because they live in darkness. It's because the light hasn't broken through to them. And so our responsibility is to take that light and share it with them and, and pray that God opens their eyes and their hearts to the, to the glorious reality of of sins forgiven by Jesus Christ, that you can actually believe in God through Jesus, receive forgiveness of sins, to have a, an actual sense of a, a purity in your life where you're washed clean of all the evil that you feel, that you carry on yourself. You can actually become lightened from the load of guilt, and you can be transformed. I mean, when I got saved, that's exactly what happened to me. And I'm certain I'm speaking for every person in this room. When, when I got saved, there was a sense like there's this huge burden that I was carrying that was literally rolled off of my back. I received an email just today. I haven't responded to it yet. Perhaps the one who wrote it is here right now. I haven't looked out to see, but I'll answer your question right now. The question was asked, you know, Pastor, you teach a lot of Bible studies, and you always seem to be, you know, doing well. Are you always doing well? Or are there times where you want to quit? I don't ever want to quit. I love what I do. I am doing well because God's alive. I mean, I wasn't doing well before I had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And yeah, I wanted to quit every day then. But now that the Lord has entered into my life, I have a reason to live. And the things that I do as a minister, I do because of the joy that God gives me for just doing those things. And, and that's just being a Christian. I mean, you know, I was already, you know, blessed to be a Christian long before I was occupying this pulpit. It's, 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 it's that knowledge that God forgives you of your sins, that you're cleansed, that your, na your name is written in the Lamb Book of Li Lamb's Book of Life, that, that you have a purpose, that you can now have joy, you can have peace, you can have contentment, you can have love, you can have all the blessings that God has and said that he would pour out on you. It's just something that you receive. It's just something you walk in. It's something that you enjoy. It's just something that transforms you. And, and that's the message of the gospel, that, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, and that God has given to us the message of reconciliation to it. We can say that God was in Christ, and therefore be reconciled to God. We who were at one time at war with him are now at peace with him because God gave to us a, a declaration of peace through what is called the gospel. He has stated to us that he has, he has won the battle. He has declared victory. He is calling for unconditional surrender. I have said, God, you are the victor. I am the person that, that, that is simply acknowledging the reality of that. I have been at war with you. I am no longer at war with you. I am no longer at, in rebellion against you. I want to be with you. I want to be forgiven by you. And, and I've asked you to forgive me. And, and you have said in your word, if I confess my sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, in Jesus' name, because you have said to me that I could be a new creation, old things being passed away and all things becoming new, I'm asking you to fulfill your promise. You are not a man that you should lie, neither are you the son of man that you should change your mind. You've said it and you'll keep your promise. And therefore, I'm asking you, Keep your promise to me. I ask Christ into my life, and now I'm born again. And that's the message. We see Jesus Christ dying on a cross. It's a place of divine judgment. 
and the land is filled with darkness, which is, is typical of the spiritual darkness that enshrouds people who don't know Christ, especially those who crucified him. But the light eventually comes back, which is typifying the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so what you have here is an actual event. And as this darkness is filling the land, notice in verse 45, he says, the veil of the temple was torn in two. The veil of the temple was torn in two. Now, Matthew, if you take notes, in Matthew 27, verse 51, in Matthew 27, 51, Matthew tells us that the veil was torn from the top to the bottom. Now, it's incredible in and of itself that this, in, in this huge veil was torn. I mean, when you read concerning it, uh, this, this veil that's being spoken of is, is a veil that separated what was called the holy place from the holy of holies. And we know that it was 60 feet long, it was 30 feet broad, and it was a palm breadth thick. It was huge. It was a huge, very heavy and very thick veil. And, and yet it's ripped by mighty hands, and it's not from the bottom, it's from the top which gives to us a picture of God himself opening up the way for us to have relationship with him. That veil that at one time had separated man from God, the high priest would go behind that veil once a year with blood in order on the Day of Atonement to make that offering to God. Well, God is simply saying that that is done away with forever. There's no need for those sacrifices ever again because Jesus Christ poured out his blood for us. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, that the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. And so that veil is now ripped. That veil is now torn so that man can enter in and have relationship with God, which is something that we need to remember because contrary to popular belief, man does not naturally have fellowship with God. There are so many people who speak about that, like man and God are tied all the time, and that's just not the truth. That's not what the Bible teaches. You know, when I was a young man, you know, during the 60s and all, we used to talk about us all being children of God. And in one sense of the word, through creation, we can all be declared to be his created, those who have been created by him, and from a creator sense to a created being sense, there's that, that reality of God being a father in that particular sense, but he's not my father spiritually until I commit my heart to Jesus Christ. And that veil was really a remembrance of the separation of, of a holy God from an unholy people. That's what that veil typified. Isaiah 59, verse 2 in the Old Testament says, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you. Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayer of the righteous. And so that veil symbolizes the separation that I had with God because of my sin. But Jesus has done something about it. Now, as I said a moment ago, the veil was torn in two from top to bottom. So it was God who himself tore it open, and he established a, a road to fellowship. The most holy place is open to all, all who come through Jesus Christ. And now heaven is available to all of us. Hebrews 10, 19, and 20 says, We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And so that veil has now been torn in two, and that's why we can go to the Lord in prayer, and that's why we can have fellowship with God. Now, that's why we can have a relationship with Him. That's how that works. That separation, that wall of separation has been dealt with. And because Jesus Christ has made the way for us, and because we are now Christians, we received Christ as Lord and Savior, our sins are forgiven, now I, as His Son, can enter into uh, the room, if you will, in prayer, and I can speak to Him and have fellowship with Him. And that's what was taking place when Jesus was dying on the cross. He was making the way possible for us. In verse 46, when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, He said, Father, into Your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. 
Now I want you to notice it says in verse 46 that Jesus cried out with a loud voice and he spoke, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When you, when you look through the four Gospels, you find that the Gospel writers preserved a few of the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. In Luke, we already saw in chapter 23, verse 34, that Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In chapter 23, we saw in verse 43, how Jesus said, I say unto you, today you'll be with me in paradise. When you look in John's gospel in chapter 19, verses 26 and 27, John records that when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. He said to the disciple, behold your mother. In Mark 15, verse 34, Mark records that, that Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In John 19, verse 28, John records that Jesus said, I thirst, and in John 19, verse 30, he said, it is finished. And so, as we look at this passage now in verse 46, it says, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. So, we know what he said. One, we know that he said, it is finished. It is finished. When he said, it is finished, that's really a translation of a single Greek word, tetelestai. The Greek word tetelestai is, is actually a word that would be used in commerce. It's a word that means paid in full, paid in full. Those words are pretty good words when you have a credit card, don't you? And you make your final payment, and then you get that receipt that says paid in full. That's a nice, oh, that's, that's good news, paid in full. I don't, are you going to continue trying to make payments on something that's already been paid for? Of course not. Now that it's paid in full, you don't owe another cent. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, that's what he cried out. Paid in full. It's been done. It is complete. It is finished. He's speaking of redemption. And he's saying that, that redemption has been won on the cross. And the payment price was his blood. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And so Jesus Christ said, it is finished. That's why I don't add anything to my own salvation. I, it is not a works-based salvation. I don't do anything to save myself. I can't do anything to save myself. It's impossible for me to pay my own debt. The debt was beyond anything that I could pay. It was beyond anything. I was more than bankrupt. It was an impossible thing for me to ever even get close to pain. And yet Jesus Christ did it for me. That's why it would be foolish for me to try and add to what he's already accomplished. Because he did it by his love for me, his mercy for me, his grace for me. You know, a lot of people can't get into that. A lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people can't relate to that. The majority of Americans believe that you have to do something to earn it. There are, there are entire religious systems that are built on, on, on adding to what God has already done. You know, the Mormons are famous for a saying that they are saved by grace. After that, they have done all that they can. You know, either it's grace or it's not. If it's grace, it's all of Him. But if it's something that I'm doing, then it's a works righteousness. And who has first given to God that God should owe him anything? It's by grace that you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, and not by works, lest anyone should boast. God actually did the work. And so when Jesus is there, dying on the cross, saying, it is finished, he's saying, paid in full. Redemption has been won. I paid the price. It was my blood. And that is one of the things that he said. But we also know that he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, when he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, these are words taken from a psalm. Psalm 31, verse 5. Into your hand I entrust my spirit. Into your hand I commit my spirit. What's interesting about that, and I want you to see this, is this psalm, Psalm 31, verse 5, formed part of the evening prayers for centuries that children would pray as they went to sleep. 
You know, uh, some of us may have heard prayers like, now I lay me down to sleep. Well, that was evening prayers for a lot of people. I, I think that's a scary prayer, by the way. I never taught my kids that. If I die before I wake, are you kidding me? I don't want them to think they're going to die in the middle of the night. I never taught them that at all. But those are evening prayers. Some people pray like well, for the Jewish child, the Jewish child would say that, as a matter of fact, that would be their prayer as they were going to sleep. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Jesus Christ on the cross actually prayed that prayer that he was accustomed to praying, a prayer that undoubtedly he prayed at bedtime, a prayer that, that revealed trust, a, a prayer that revealed dependence. And so Jesus died with a psalm on his lips. Jesus died gently, and peacefully and willingly. And that cross became his pillow as he laid his head down and he died. And as he was doing that, as he was saying this, this prayer, a prayer of trust and commitment, a prayer that, that children prayed during his day, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Matthew once again, gives us greater insight. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, Matthew says that Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Yielded up. He dismissed his spirit. He said, spirit, go. Most people, when they're about to breathe their last, are not dismissing their spirit. Most people are trying to retain their spirit as long as they can. They, 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 will, they will violently fight for the last breath, but not Jesus. What Jesus did is Jesus yielded it up. He said, it is done. It is finished. I have become that perfect sacrifice. I have taken upon myself the sin of the world. I am the Lamb of God, and I am doing this now, and it is now complete. And so that's when he says, Spirit, go. Now, as this takes place, verse 47, the centurion saw what had happened, and he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Now, when you see centurions in the New Testament, uh, one, a centurion was a, a military commander who had authority over 100 soldiers. That's why he's called a centurion. There were a century. A century is a hundred. He had responsibility for a hundred soldiers. And so, in the Scriptures, you see them very often, and, and every time you see a centurion, they are somebody who has a lot of integrity, and, and they're simply good people. They have character. This is a man who's watching what is taking place, and as he sees it, and he sees the way Jesus Christ dies, and, and remember, these are guys who had been at crosses and seen many people die, and they've seen the way they die. They've seen how people die. They've seen them as they have spit on their tormentors, as they have shrieked, as they have, as they have cursed, as they've done all of that. They've seen that, that this man died in a different way. And as he was watching him die, it, it spoke to him. It did something to him. And, and so Luke tells us, he simply says, this was a righteous man. But Mark tells us in chapter 15, verse 39, that he's, he said, surely this was the Son of God. This man, this righteous man, is more than simply a man. This may be his profession of faith. This may be an indication that this one who was watching this take place actually embraced the one who was dying there on that cross. And as this is taking place, notice verse 48, the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. So the people in general are watching this, and they're mourning over what happened. And then they leave. And I would assume that some felt guilty knowing that they had taken part in such an evil, evil action. They've been there. They saw what happened. Now that it's done, it's almost as if they awaken to what has happened. And as they see what has taken place, and they've seen an innocent man die, and they've heard the conversations and perhaps even overheard that centurion as he's saying, this is the righteous man, this is the Son of God, that they began to show signs of mourning over what had happened, perhaps a sense of conviction that they had been part of something like that. And they turn and they begin to melt away. They begin to walk away. But verse 49 says, all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. 
These are the ones who couldn't tear themselves away. We know that, that John and Mary were there at the cross. We know that because Jesus addresses them. But there are others who are there who are watching what takes place. Matthew 27, 56 names Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and he goes on to mention Salome, the mother of Zebedee's sons. These are women who are there who are watching what is taking place. And as they're watching this, they can't tear themselves away. But, verse 50, behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision and deed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. And so now we have a man here that we're introduced to once again, a man by the name of Joseph. He's referred to as a council member, and he's also described as being a good and a just man, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. We know that according to Matthew 27, 57, he was a rich man. We know according to Mark 15, 43, that he was an honorable counselor waiting for the kingdom of God. And John gives us some special insight in jo into Joseph in John 19, verse 38, where he says, Joseph of Arimathea was a disciple of Jesus, but listen to what John said, but secretly for fear of the Jews. And so this is a man who's a council member, meaning he's part of the Jewish council called the Sanhedrin. This is a man who is good. This is a man who is just. This is a man who is rich. This is an honorable counselor. This is a follower of Christ, but he's a closet believer. He's a chameleon, if you will, in some ways. This is a man who had a, a sense of faith in Jesus Christ, but wasn't willing to be open about it. This is a man who would listen to what he had to say and agreed with him, so much so that he became a, a follower of Jesus, but in secret. I cannot understand that, to be honest with you. And maybe I'm just from a different time, and I know I am. When I got saved, I was not ashamed of Christ. I wasn't ashamed of being associated with him. I wasn't ashamed that people knew that I was a Jesus freak. As a matter of fact, I took a certain kind of pride in that, if you will. I mean, I wanted to be associated with Jesus Christ. I wanted people to say, you're a follower of Christ. I didn't have a bad time when people put me down for it. I didn't get embarrassed or ashamed. I didn't say, oh, I'm going to go back to the world because look how they're treating me because now that I'm a Christian, I have no friends. I didn't care. It didn't matter to me. I thought, you know what? I was going to hell. Now I'm going to heaven. If these people don't like me for being a person going to heaven, that, that's something they've got to deal with. Why am I going to deny Christ for he never denied me? I never had a problem with that. I still don't have a problem being associated with Jesus Christ. I like being associated with Jesus. No, no, I'm not one of these guys who runs around with giant flags saying, I'm a Jesus freak, how about you? I'm not somebody who can stand on a street corner with a bullhorn and saying, hey, you're going to hell. I can't do things like that. I've never been like that. I'm just not ashamed to admit it. Why would I be? He's not ashamed to call me his brother. Why would I be ashamed of him? I was about eight years old, and I had been playing, and I was pretty dirty, just filthy. I'd been playing in the dirt. I had an older brother named Frank, my ugly brother. And uh, he and I were walking together. I, walk, I was barefooted, just dirty from head to toe. And here comes the girl from his school, he knows. And as she comes walking towards us and we're walking towards our house, she walks by and Frank says hi to her and acts kind of like he doesn't know me, though I was walking right next to him. <laughs> and... Uh, 
And I looked at him after she walked by, and I said something to him. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I had noticed that he, he kind of tried to distance himself from me. And my brother looked at me, and he says, yeah, I, I didn't want her to know that you're with me because I'm ashamed of you. And, and, you know, when you're eight years old and your older brother says, I'm ashamed of you, well, you know what? Obviously, I'm 58, and I haven't forgotten it. Fifty years later, I still hate him. <laughs> That's why he's my ugly brother. That word meant something to me then, and it means something to me now. And you know what the Bible says? He is not ashamed. Jesus is not ashamed to call them brethren. He's not ashamed of you. And there have been people who have been ashamed of you. No doubt, if you were a stinker at all ever in your life, there's got to be a time when someone was a bit embarrassed at what you had done. I know that I caused a lot of people shame. My brother, just one of them. My mom, my dad, those who love me the most, caused them shame. I don't rejoice in that. It's just a fact. I did. But there's one person who's not ashamed of me, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus is not ashamed to say, that one's mine. And you want to know something? That means something to me. It does. That means something to me. That's what motivates me in many ways, to know that, that God loves me. I actually get touched telling you that. I shouldn't sometimes. I, I feel kind of like a girl. <laughs> you can't see, but I'm wearing high heels right now. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. I, not that I'm wearing high heels. It, it's, tr <laughs> it's true that when I take the time to think of how God loves me and how God loves you, and he's not ashamed of me, well, that means something. Don't be ashamed of the Lord. Confess him. Be associated with him. Don't be ashamed of the Lord. When I was 20 years old, I went into the military, was in the army, served my country in a time when it was not popular. I would not wear my uniform. People mocked us. I should have uh, I should have been able to I should have been able to wear that uniform I tried to do the honorable thing I was in a highly decorated unit I served at the 82nd Airborne it's an honorable unit highly decorated it wasn't easy to become a paratrooper. It wasn't easy. It was difficult, challenging. It took discipline and courage. But I wouldn't wear the uniform. Because my nation was ashamed of me. Thousands of others, my brothers and sisters in arms. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't. The Vietnam era is ancient history to some. It's living history to others. I had a nation that really wasn't proud of me. But I had a dad and a mom who were. And I had 
experiences like that. Those have gone into making me a man who says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of believing in my God. I'm not ashamed of declaring it. My colors are open. I want people to know. I encourage you to be the same way. I discovered that sometimes people won't admit to their association with Jesus because they're too busy wanting to live in the world and be like the world and be a associated with the world and liked by the world, that they simply don't want to wear the stigma of being a, a Christian. And let's face it, you know, we are not the most popular people in the press. The press actually doesn't seem to care an awful lot for Christians, not sincere ones, not Bible-believing ones. And so you can get beaten down by the world, and the world rejects. During the day of Joseph of Arimathea, he had listened to this one named Jesus. And he agreed. He became a disciple, a follower. But he was afraid. He was afraid of what takes place when somebody actually is identified with him. Jesus had said in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So this is a man who had to move from being a secret disciple to one who was open. There was another one that uh, was associated with him, another one who was at one time a secret disciple, a man by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus... We're told in John's gospel, chapter 3, had come to Jesus by night and had spoken to him, and he was a leading rabbi. Jesus referred to Nicodemus as the teacher of Israel, speaking of his high esteem amongst people. And we know the story of Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night and spoke to him and told him, no one can do the works that you do unless God's with them. And Jesus had spoken to him, and, and apparently that conversation had led to his conversion. We're told in John's Gospel in chapter 7, verses 50 through 52, Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, meaning he was a member of the council, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? They answered and said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. At one point, Nicodemus actually came to the defense of Christ, but he was a secret follower, but now... He is openly following the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these two men are working together. Now it says in verse 52, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. At first, Pilate is surprised that Jesus died so quickly. Mark tells us Pilate marveled that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time because normally... People could die on that cross. It took them a long time. Some actually stayed on the cross for days. And, and Jesus had not really been on the cross that long, and it really surprised him. And that's why he asked, has he been dead for some time? But the fact is that Jesus had dismissed his spirit, and yes, he is dead. And so what happens is he took down, verse 53, took his body down, wrapped it in linen, laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before, that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near and the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. And so he comes and he takes Jesus' body and he puts it in a tomb. Joseph had a tomb in his family plot that he made available for the body of Jesus Christ. Matthew tells us Joseph, when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, laid it in a new tomb, his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. John says, Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury you see, Jews didn't embalm, but they did perfume in order to mask the odor of decay. And they would put myrrh, and that's what they did. They put myrrh, which is a fragrant resin, 
and they put some sandalwood, which is aromatic. And this mixture that John speaks about was sufficient really for 200 people. And that showed great respect, the respect that they were having for Jesus as they were burying him. But it tells us in verse 54 that that day was a preparation and the Sabbath drew near. It's nearing 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Sabbath is fast approaching. So they hastily buried Jesus so as not to work on the Sabbath. But it says, the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. They observed the tomb, how his body was laid. Then they returned, prepared spices, fragrant oils. They rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So what they did is they noted where he had been buried. But they came with a plan uh, that they were going to return and give him a proper burial. This is the thing that I find most interesting, and I'll close with this. What happens is Jesus is buried. The stone is rolled over across that tomb. The women are there watching what has taken place. Joseph of Arimathea, as well as Nicodemus, being counselors, being members of the Sanhedrin, and being wealthy men, have gone and spoken to Pilate. That took courage for them to do that because they could be associated at that point with a follower of Jesus, and Jesus had just been executed uh, for crimes against Rome. So they came fully out of that closet, and they openly said, we're followers of him, in asking for the body. The body was not to remain on the cross into the Sabbath day, and they wanted to remove it as fast as possible. Pilate is marveling that the man is already dead. When he discovers that he is dead, he gives him permission. So they go and they take the body. Nicodemus puts a lot of spices and aromatics on Jesus because of the decay. He doesn't want him to smell. But as they're putting him in that borrowed tomb, into the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the women are watching. And they're making note of where this is taking place because as soon as they can, they're going to return and they're going to bring more spices and all because they want to give to him a proper burial. But what is amazing is in all of this, they have forgotten something. They forgot what Jesus said. Matthew 16, 21 says, From that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. They forgot that Jesus has said to them, over and over and over again. Several times Matthew records this, as well as the other Gospels, that he is going to be killed, but he's going to rise from the dead. He said it so many times. In his ministry, they had seen him perform three uh, uh, resurrections of the dead. They had seen him do it. They believed that he could do anything, except they didn't believe that he would be raised from the dead. Everything hinged on whether Jesus Christ remained in that grave or came out of it. Everything. Because if Jesus Christ remained in that grave, all of his teachings were not worthy of even following. Because everything in Christianity rests on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I was in a theology class at a, at a university and uh, the professor asked this question, does it really matter if Jesus Christ was raised from the dead? Does that matter? His take on it was that it didn't. He said, well, even if Jesus was just in a spiritual sense resurrected or the spirit of Christ that can dwell within people today, that spirit, that attitude of Christianity, is that not sufficient? Well, the answer to that is, no, that is not sufficient because Jesus Christ said, I will be raised the third day. And he spoke of his own body. He started that out all the way back in John chapter 2 when he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And he spoke of the temple of his own body. From the very beginning, Jesus pointed out that he would be raised from the dead. C.S. Lewis says that either Jesus is a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's the Lord. Those are your options. A liar because he said he'd be raised from the dead. A lunatic because he said he'd be raised from the dead. Or the Lord because he was raised from the dead. And the bottom line is, we as Christians do not worship a dead teacher, but a risen Lord. And his disciples 
forgot the trauma of all that had taken place, the sorrow of heart, the scene of his physical body placed in a tomb and a, and a huge uh, wheel rolled in front of that tomb, sealed the sound of it as it, as it rested against that, that wall there that it would be placed against, just the, the, the sickening thud, the knowledge that Jesus is dead and buried, the knowledge that they have seen many friends and relatives who have been buried and they never were raised from the dead. Well, that's stuck in their hearts, and so they're thinking, he's dead, let's go and get some, some uh, various things, fragrant oils and spices, so that we can come back and, and we can give him a, a better funeral, uh, something more worthy of him. And that's what they're thinking, and that's how it's going. And I, I usually say this, the resurrection of Jesus means a lot of things to me and to us as believers, but one of the things that I've learned through his resurrection is when things look bad, give it three days. Give it three days. That's the truth. When things are looking bad, I have a tendency of saying, let's just wait on the Lord. You know, what could look worse than Jesus in a, in a tomb? What could have been worse than that? I have a tendency of doing that. My wife can tell you that it's true. Things look bad, let's give it three days. See what God can do. If he can raise Jesus from the dead, I'm certain he can work in any problem I have. Let's give him some time to work, because he does work. And that's something that these beautiful ladies and his disciples, other disciples, did not remember. But they're about to receive an awakening, and it's only going to be three days later.